Hey, Crosspoint, PG here. I'm so glad you're at church today, whether watching online or in person. I just want you to know that as kids' ministry opens up on Sunday mornings beginning August 30th, that uh, we're, we are going to still have our CP Kids Facebook page where every day we're posting coloring pages you can print off and color with your kids, learning God's Word every day at home. And we're going to do Facebook Live, not at 3.30 as we've done for the last six months, but Wednesdays at 4 o'clock. That'll give time uh, for the kids to get home from school and be able to settle in, do their homework, and then watch Facebook Live with me and Darlene. God bless you. Have a great service. Welcome to Crosspoint Church this morning. Let's put our hands together.
good to be in church today. Go ahead and take this time and give someone an air high five around you and then you can take a seat. Go ahead and take a seat and turn your attention to the screen. Hey, what a great time of worship we just had. I'm Dan Pagno, the pastor of ministry development here at Cross Point Church, and this is Fisher Woodley, worship director. If you are new here, welcome. We are so glad you've joined us, whether you're online or in person. We would love to connect with you and give you a gift. Please go to our website below, and there you can click on Next Steps and then Connect. And then you can fill out a digital connect card so we can get to know you. The movement youth had an awesome movie night last week. They were able to raise money for Speed the Light. Now they're going to be having a raking fundraiser for Speed the Light on Saturday, October 17th. Sign-ups are in the check-in table outside of the youth room. Or you can just find Pastor Madison and let her know that you would like to help out with this. Yes, speaking of raking, if you are in need of any raking or yard cleanup, our youth students would just love to come and help you and raise money for Speed the Light, which in turn raises money for missionaries all over the world. Please text Pastor Madison at the number below, and we'll be out cleaning on Saturday. October 7th. Now ladies, don't forget to sign up uh, to join the next sisterhood event. It's Dream Again on Saturday, October 10th from 9 to 11 a.m. here at the church. Ladies, you're not going to want to miss this. The cost is $10. Sign up today at our website at crosspointwaverly.com slash sisterhood or just right below as you see the website. Yes, at Crosspoint, we are so blessed with our pastoral staff and it is Pastor Appreciation Month. So the board has put together a box on a table outside the auditorium for cards and gifts. Let's show them how much we appreciate them. Thank you for joining us. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. It's that time of service where we get to continue with our worship with our tithe and offerings. And we just want to let you know that you can give by dropping off at our uh, offering box in the back as you head out after service. You can also give online at crosspointwaverly.com. And you can also set up from there a text to give. And so the ways that you can give, we want to just say thank you for your continuous generosity and giving with your tithe of 10%. And even going above and beyond that with Kingdom Builders. And if you ever are wondering more about what Kingdom Builders is... Go to our website and you can find about Kingdom Builders and learn about all the things that we've been able to help ministry move forward and reach the next generation and other people to experience the love that God has for them. And so each week we have a time where we pray for a specific location. And today we're going to be praying for Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, right now there's 10 unreached people groups. 41.7% unreached. And so we're going to be praying for them. We're also going to be praying for something else this morning as well. Uh, Pastor Jonathan's not here this morning. Um, he's with his friend Glenn Reynolds. Uh, Glenn Reynolds, many of you may know, he uh, has spoken at our church. He's given us, uh, he also gives us legal counsel uh, and a great friend to Pastor Jonathan. And this last week, uh, Glenn Reynolds' son unexpectedly passed away. And so Pastor's been down there ministering with them. And so we want to be praying for the Reynolds family during this time. And so as I'm praying, I just encourage you just to lift them up in prayer with me and agree with me just to pray for peace and comfort for them during this time. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love, your mercy, and your grace, Lord. God, we pray for the people in Hong Kong, for the 10% uh, or 10 people, unreached people groups, Lord, the 41.7% that haven't even heard your name, Lord. God, we pray that they come to find to know you and have a relationship with you. May they experience you today. May they hear your name and hear the love that you have for them. Give them hope today. God, we pray for Glenn Reynolds and his family right now, Lord. God, we pray for comfort. We pray for peace. God, we just pray that your presence just wrap their love around them in this season, Lord. God, we're thankful for our pastor to be able to go and just love on them during this time. Just give him the words and the encouragement just to be with them during this season, Lord. God, we just pray for that continuous comfort, Lord, that you can only bring. God, we put our hope and we put our trust in you in everything, Lord. God, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we just continue to worship our Creator. your 
heart feels like it's caving in. So there the peace begins. Sure as the dawn calls the sun, Jesus, we hear your love. Call out the light in Listen to these lyrics and let it prepare your heart spiritually and mentally. Just get ready for communion. Took a breath, you breathe your. 
shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, come and have to be. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, come and have to be. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, come and have to be. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear Continue to keep that active heart of worship right now. We're going to get ready to partake in communion. This is a time where we get to stop and we're going to reflect on what, what Jesus did for our lives. I want to let you know that you don't have to be a member here of Cross Point Church. We just ask that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We believe that communion is a time to stop, reflect, and remember and never forget what Jesus has done for our lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 and 24, it says, For I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for us. He loved us. As I pray, I just encourage you to just in your own words, just give God thanks for that sacrifice that he did upon our lives. And then we'll partake of the bread together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you cared about us, that you, you loved us so much, that you paid the price for us. You didn't have to, but you did. And so, God, we just thank you. And we remember in this moment what you have done. And we give you thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake of the bread together. In verse 25, it says, In the same way, also he took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This is Jesus' new covenant with us. It's where we get to have a relationship with him. To have a relationship that we can call out to his name. Whenever anything's going on, we can talk to him and he hears us. And so again, I encourage you as I'm praying, just in your own words, just be praying and giving God thanks for the new covenant and for our relationship that we have with him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that we get to have a relationship with you. God, that we can call on you no matter what, and you hear our voice. God, that you loved us so much, that you did so much for us. God, we give you thanks, Lord. God, and we remember your love for us, God. 
We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake of the juice together. Just going to continue to worship just for just a brief longer. And I just encourage you just to pray and give thanks to God as, before we dive into the message. you guys, but I'm so thankful that we don't have a conservative God when it comes to love, that he is reckless and full out abandonment pursuing each and every one of us with his love and desire to have right relationship with each one of his creation, which is you in this audience. Would you join me in prayer as we transition into the message this morning? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you are the king, that you are the alpha the omega, the beginning and the end. And I pray that today you'd help each one of us leave today with just a little bit more hope, realizing the promises that you have for each one of us. God, we thank you so much. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. All right, please be seated. So excited to see you guys here in this audience this morning. For those of you that I haven't had a chance to introduce myself to, my name is Clint Whitcomb and my wife Stephanie and I have been part of this church since day one and we're proud to serve and proud to be here in this room with you this morning. You know, for the past eight months, I've listened to Pastor Jonathan on this stage and the numerous pastors that I listen to online or through podcasts talk a whole lot about the topic of hope. Why? Because it seems that the world that we're living in now is in a hopeless standstill and Having a reminder of the hope that's found in Jesus Christ is a good thing. Am I right? Good. The hope of a more prosperous time. A hope of life more abundantly than most of us have experienced in 2020 thus far. So the question that I have for the audience this morning is if by the time I conclude today's message in prayer, if you leave with just a little bit more hope, than what you entered today, would that be okay with everybody? All right, good, I'll do that then. I'll see what I can do. Because Jesus says that I have come so that you may have life and have it abundantly. The prophet Jeremiah spoke God's words to his people and he says, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans not to harm you, but to prosper you. Plans to give you hope in the future. It continues on in verse 12. He says that you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I'm grateful to have a heavenly father who has my best interest in mind. He sees the comprehensive picture of everything when we just see a small section of it all. Do we trust in the goodness of God? Verse 12 says that when you call out to God and pray, what's it say? It says he will hear you. How comforting is it to know that we have a God that desires the best for us, and not just for us, but the billions of people of the past, the billions of the people of the present, and the billions of people in the future. It's mind-boggling to think that he not only desires to have a relationship with us, but he wants the best for each one of us. God says that you will find me when you seek me with all of your, what? Heart. Do you ever get tired of hearing God's promises? Because there's such good promises to have a prosperous and abundant life. But the way that many of us feel right now, the struggles that we're putting up with, the obstacles that we're dealing with, and the challenges in front of us are not his plans for us. God's always wanted us to have a hope. 
That's why he sent his son Jesus to the cross to die, so that we can have hope for a better future, hope for a greater day. But not just to have an eternity that looks better than what it does right now, but on this earth right now, God wants us to rely on the Holy Spirit and listen to his commands and obedience so that we can live abundantly before we spend eternity in paradise. The Lord wants each one of us to enter our own promised land. See, the promised land was something that God had promised one of the early people in the Bible. If you look at Genesis, there's a person brought up named Abraham, who was an elderly man with an elderly wife who had no kids. And God said, hey, guess what? You will have kids. And I promise you this, Abraham, that your descendants will be as numerous as the sand in the sea. And I will give your descendants a promised land. And that's where I want to pick up as we fast forward many generations, a few generations. The seeds of Abraham and Sarah, who again were elderly, read it. It's at the back part of Genesis. That generation, those descendants now number two million strong. And they're living well in the country of Egypt. When the new pharaoh comes to town and he says, holy cats in the cradle at the silver spoon, there's more than two million of these people that follow a different God than we do. And they are a, a nation of themselves in size. And he worried about what if they rose up and would come against our kingdom. We might not be able to overcome them. So let's take away their power. Let's take away their life. And let's make them slaves to Egypt. And in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, this is where we hear an account of the slavery. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I'm concerned with their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out into a land of spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Sounds sticky, doesn't it? The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pezzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and a bunch of other ites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to the Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you're so kind that you're loving and you're merciful and your grace and mercy is sufficient for us. I pray that you'd help guide my message, that each one of us can walk away from today's message that's come from you to have a little bit more hope on how to move forward in this time. God, you're so good. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. So God saw that his people, the Israelites, Abraham's descendants, were living in utter misery. He heard their cries and was concerned for their suffering. So God came down to rescue them. He used his servant Moses to lead his people out of Egypt towards that promised land that had been promised many moons ago. See, God's plan was not to have his people suffer. His plan was to have them live in their promised land. Remember Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you. This is Romeo Jemessi's life verse. Declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, declares the Lord, but plans to give you hope and a future. Have you cried out to God for help? Have you asked for healing from God to be set free from the oppression that's in your life? Have you given God your petition, how you think things should be, how you wish things were better than they were? See, the Israelites, they were in captivity for 400 years. 400 years. It's hard to wrap our mind around the fact that this group of people were slaves for 400 years. So the question that God asked me, and I think he asked each one of us, is will we be faithful in the process and the in-between until we do receive our promise? Because Philippians 4, 6 says, don't be anxious about anything, but by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, bring your request to God. And let us be sure that in 2020, God has heard our cry. 
He does see our sufferings and our pains, many of which have been exasperated in 2020. But you know, 2020 hasn't been our family's favorite year either. Back in May, our oldest child, our, our oldest son, Weston, was complaining of eye pain. We figured he was just had a speck of dirt or grass in his eye because it's the summer, you know, and we're, we're out in the yard a lot. But on the second day where the, the evening sleep didn't wash out, whatever was bothering him in the eye, the second day my wife calls me at work and says, hey, you just got done with a Zoom school meeting and he couldn't concentrate. He was crying afterwards. His eye was, was really giving him a lot of fit. So I came home that afternoon, didn't think anything of it. We did our normal things. We played outside, maybe shot some guns because we're, we're rednecks. <laughs> and he didn't complain about the pain in his eye. So we didn't think anything of it again. And again, I mentioned we're rednecks. So I was getting up really, really early the next morning to take my nine-year-old out turkey hunting. And I woke him up, said, hey, still, you want to go? He's, oh, yeah, you know, he was, he was pretty excited. So perfect, we'll say goodbye to Ma. I'll be downstairs finishing our, our packing and Next thing I know, he's, he's, he's crying on the steps because his pain is, is great in his eye. So, we, you know, we don't know what to do. It's 4.30 in the morning, so we'll go back to bed and see if he can sleep it off again. And later that morning, I guess when he comes down the steps for his day, he's in excruciating pain. He's, he's bawling. He can't see out of his eye very well. So we immediately take him to the optometrist as soon as they open the doors to see if they can get whatever's in his eye out because it's clearly causing him a lot of pain. So she goes into the optometrist, and they were able to find a little speck of something in his eye, but the vision didn't get any better. This is obviously a red flag for the optometrist, so she wanted to do further testing and further exams. So she does these things and comes back into the room after looking over the results with news that we weren't expecting. She says that Weston's optic nerve in his, his right eye is swollen, and he needs further assessment right away. I don't want to scare you, but typically when the optic nerve is swollen like this, that means something is pressing up against it. I don't want you to Google anything. I just want you to get to the hospital. I've contacted your pediatrician. You need to get there right away. Without saying it, I believe she's thinking it's a tumor. So we met at the hospital with his doctor, and she ordered a brain MRI be conducted a couple hours after that. So in the interim at the time, we drove home and decided to gather our neighborhood and pray. And just so you don't think we're crazy wackos, our neighborhood has consisted of four family member groups, and Carrie Burrish came out too. And we prayed over our son. Maybe you think we're wacky because all four of us live within a mile. I don't know. <laughs> and we prayed over our son and said, whatever this result may be, God, you are in control, and we trust you, and we believe you, and we pray for a miraculous healing upon our son, that it may be a testimony someday for him that it may birth a ministry out of him someday. So we prayed over our son, and then before we could even head back to, to the doctor's office to do the MRI, the office calls and says, regardless of what happens with the MRI, we're likely going to be sending you to Iowa City. They want to start treatment immediately so he doesn't go blind in his eye. You're going to need to get there. So we make arrangements for our other two kids, our neighbors. We're willing to watch them. We packed our clothes, and headed back into Waverly. Weston did his brain MRI at that point, <clears throat> and when we came back into the doctor's office, which they're only going to let one of us in there, but somehow two of us got in there because Daddy wasn't playing that game. We sit down in the office, and here come the doctor along with the nurse. And the nurse says, Weston, I bet you're hungry. I bet you haven't eaten much today. You want a snack, like a warm cookie or something? And of course, his eyes lit up. He's like, you bet. So they left the room. You talk about a sinking feeling. And we're preparing ourselves for some news that we probably weren't ready to hear. So she says, well, we've looked at the results. And we don't think it's a tumor, but there is a lesion on the eye, which is a breakdown. And we also found another one where the brain and the spine meet. We think it's probably MS. The radiologist and I agree with it. Probably MS, multiple sclerosis. And you get to Iowa City right now. So we start driving to Iowa City. I'll tell you what, driving to Iowa City, knowing that Iowa City was a little bit bigger and probably can't get through the back door, was extremely difficult as a parent, knowing that one of us would have to draw straws to see who would be with our son. 
during this experience. Trying to talk to our son and console him of why we're driving to Iowa City and why we have to go to the doctor's office, why we have to spend time in that hospital, do another terrible round of testing that he just had to go through and be still. That's hard for Whitcombs to be still for an extended period of time. He didn't understand it. He didn't understand why his dad wouldn't be able to be with him in the hospital room, holding his hand and giving him encouragement. And then we had a struggle with that and consoling our son for that hour and a half drive, but also not allowing our minds to go to the what ifs, which is really easy to do in situations like this. Dropping my son off again, thank you, COVID, and saying goodbye to my son and wife was extremely difficult for me as a, as a father and a man. Trying to find any way to console my son, I said, I'll do whatever I can. I'll stay as close as I can. Heck, I'll sleep in the truck if you need me to. And he said, you would do that? You would sleep in your truck? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I slept in my truck. Yay. You know that they change shifts at 4 in the morning in the parking lot? That's like want to know that. Uh, but during this time, we haven't forgotten God's promises for us. And as I sat in my truck and prayed and cried, I kept asking God, how can I fight for my son who's in the inside of the hospital? I'm stuck on the outside. I know I can pray, but I can't hold his hand. I can't give him encouragement I can't model to him what strength looks like. I can't lay hands on him physically for healing. I just wanted to be He-Man and knock a hole in that wall in the building and sink my way up into his room. And that's when I felt God put Jericho on my heart. So I quickly opened up the book of Joshua. And here's what I read. Joshua 1, verses 1 through 9. So after the death of Moses, again, Moses was the one that led the descendants of Abraham out of slavery of Egypt and wandered around the wilderness for 40 years. And this is where we're picking up. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses is aid. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon, from the great river Euphrates, and all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea to the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it from the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of law always on your lips. Meditate, it, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. Oh, that's a good verse. That's a good passage. See, Moses had led God's people well. But unfortunately, in their last moment, God's people failed to trust God for victory. And thus, the older generation did not get to enter the promised land. But during these years of wandering, the children of this older generation began to learn that through trust and obedience to God comes victory and the opposite tragedy. Joshua was one of those younger generation. And he followed Moses for 40 years as his aide. Joshua was that next generation to lead the Israelites to their promised land. And God said, you'll have your land if you stay focused on me. Don't look to the right or the left. Stay focused on me. There will be battles. You'll win if you stay strong and courageous, if you obey my commands, if you study and meditate on my word, on God's word, both day and night. Pretty much, he was saying, if you do what's in the Bible today, then you will be successful and prosperous. The Lord will be with you no matter the challenge, 
No matter the obstacle, he'll be with you wherever you go. Joshua was taking on a huge challenge, leading two million people to a land that they've never been to, to fight and conquer a group of people, the Canaanite people that they've never seen before. So what new challenges are you facing today? What big change has happened in your life or is happening at this moment? Let me tell you, doing it without God would be awfully frightening. We may not be conquering nations, but each day each one of us is faced with a new enemy, a new enemy of temptation, dealing with difficult people, difficult circumstances. And guess what? God promises to be with us, that he'll never abandon us. And by relying on the Holy Spirit and having obedience to God's commands, you can conquer many of life's challenges. So now we skip ahead to Joshua 6, where the Israelites are going to have their first battle. This is the heavily fortified, big-walled city of Jericho. This city was birthed 2,000 years before even Joshua was born, making it one of the oldest cities in the world. Some of these places on the wall were as high as 20 foot tall and as deep and wide as 20 foot wide. The walls were patrolled by soldiers who could see miles away. There was no sneak attack coming to the city of Jericho. To the Canaanite people, this was a symbol of strength and power of military force, the city and fortress of Jericho. They considered it invincible. Sometimes the things that we go through seem impossible, almost invincible. We know that sometimes it takes an act of God to overcome it. So it's easy to become overwhelmed by the severity of the obstacle that's in front of us. So Joshua 6, I'm going to skip some of the, the verses just to make sure we stay on track. But first verse is chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went in, no one went out. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've delivered Jericho in your hands along with its king and its fighting men. All still stands there, Lord. How have you delivered Jericho? Well, let me tell you. He says, march around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Okay, okay. It's a good plan. On the seventh day, when you're doing this, make sure that the seven priests, they carry trumpets of ram's horns, ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing those trumpets. And when you hear them sound a long blast of the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go right in and everyone straight in. Verse 7, and he ordered the army, Joshua, advance, march around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. Verse 14 and 15, so on the second day, they march around the city once and return to camp. They did this for six days. They were obedient. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. Except on that day, they circled the city seven times. And the seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, give your battle cry, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. In verse 20, when the trumpet sounded, the army roared. And the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and took the city. See, this invincible wall came crumbling down without one soldier even throwing a stone at that wall. God has done the impossible. He took down the invincible city of Jericho. God did the impossible, and he still does. Your impossible is possible with God. You know, after reading this story of Jericho, I knew what I had to do. I was going to march around Iowa City's hospital system seven times. I would begin praying, worshiping, and listening to sermons and declaring victory. What God told me was sometimes if you want to see victory on the inside, you've got to do battle on the outside. Sometimes if you want to see victory on the inside, you've got to do battle on the outside. And as the spiritual leader of my household, I felt so out of control that I couldn't be in the battle, that I couldn't be in the room with my son doing the heavy lifting for my family. But what God told me through the story of the battle of Jericho is this, 
that I don't need to win this battle. What I need to do is march around that building in obedience to God. Model to your son what it looks like to be a warrior of your faith so that he can fight on the inside because God is capable of doing it. And what's interesting about the Israelite army, what they knew they were doing was marching around the city of Jericho. But what they didn't know was they were marching around a conquered enemy. The battle was being fought on the inside by God. They were doing battle on the outside. All they needed to do was be obedient to God's instructions because obedience leads to victory. So that's what I did. I had the opportunity to call my son and say, I'm going to tell you about the story of Jericho. I told him about the story of Jericho and I said, that that is what God is telling me to do for you. And let me tell you, each time I made my pass around that corner of the facility, I'd call up there and he'd come to the window and I'd see his smile waving at me and he'd see his dad that was fighting on the outside for victory on the inside. And that gave me enough encouragement to take that next step, to make that next lap for my son. You know, this was our family's Jericho moment. So the question I have for each one of us is, do you want to enter the promised land? What's your promised land look like? Is it free from your addiction that you may be struggling with? Is it an addiction of alcoholism, smoking, pornography, prescription drugs, social media, TV, overeating? Does your promised land give you a sense of purpose? That each morning you wake up knowing that this is what God wants you to do? Is your promised land to be healthy, both mentally and and physically? Is it a healthier marriage? Is it financial security to meet your family's needs? We knew what God's promises were for us. It wasn't to sit back and accept this prognosis. We wouldn't be able to be passive in this matter. To not allow ourselves to dwell on the what-if thoughts, which, again, are very easy to do in these scenarios. We need to take action. So I marched. My wife, she fought on the inside. She began declaring victory, putting God's promises over our son, keeping worship music on both day and night, laying hands on him and praying over him, praying healing verses over him, his promises that he has for his children. She was reading her Bible and she stayed up and patrolled that room in prayer with petition, bringing her request with thanksgiving to God. But most importantly, in those scary moments for Weston during this time, I was able to remind him through FaceTime that he can do all things through Christ that strengthens him. And he believed it. And I reminded him that God can heal you, and he will heal you, and he believed it. And we had a multitude of warriors back home praying. Our family, our church staff, Western School, our friends, and many more. We knew that having a sick son is not what our promised land looked like. So we battled, and we remembered God's promises, the same promises that he has for you. So here's what the days looked like in Iowa City for Weston. The first day, Weston went through a regimen of testing. The second day, they began examining the results, began ruling things out. No treatment had been prescribed or given during these first two days. And the doctor came in to give this update to us. Where your lesions are located, and at this time, they'd done a full MRI of the spine, and they found a third one. So there's one in the right eye, there's one in the back of the head where the spine and the brain meet, and one behind the shoulder blades on the spine. He says, where these lesions are located, your son should have shown up and able to see out of his right eye. He shouldn't be able to walk in here on his own power. He shouldn't be able to use his limbs. Okay? Not just this, but when I come in and do my assessments, I'm blown away at how strong your son is. Not only this, but when children arrive with the severity of these lesions, they continuously, progressively get worse until we start treating them. Your son has remained stable, if not slightly approved, each day that he's been here, and I haven't started treatment. The doctor says, I can't explain these things. Well, guess what? We can. God. There is power in the name of Jesus. So we plugged into that power source. We knew that God was the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he conquered Satan by death, by the 
death of his son, the burial and the resurrection, then we're already fighting a conquered enemy. If he sent Joshua and his army around the city of Jericho just to prove that they were fighting a conquered army on the inside, then he'll do the same thing for our son. Now, Weston just completed his follow-up MRI, which revealed the one lesion was fully healed and gone. The other two lesions had slightly improved or at least stable, which was a huge victory. They're still trying to figure out if it is something or if it's just a one-time clinical event. As a family, as a body of believers, we're believing that it was something, but God took that away. And now it'll be that one-time clinical event. We're being wise to go through all the protocol and follow-up treatments <clears throat> just so that someday we can fully verify that this was a miraculous healing from God. And then we will testify it. What we know is that God has already put his mighty healing hand on our son, and we're thankful for that. But God doesn't want that just for the Whitcomb household. He wants each one of us to arrive in our own promised land. He wants us to live a life of abundance. God keeps his promises. So what's keeping you from reaching your promised land and staying there? Is there a metaphorical wall standing in front of you that you can't get through? Is it that addiction? Is it unforgiveness of a person who has deeply wronged you? Is it not walking in complete healing? Is it a prodigal child? Is it something that you're maybe struggling with? Maybe struggling with as a parent? Is it an issue that yourself or a child or another family member is dealing with? What is your radical step that you need to take to believe that God has better for you? Will you seize your Jericho moment? No matter what's going on in your world, there's the ability to have a Jericho moment for you. Something that you've been staring at and wondering, how will I get over top of this obstacle? How will I get through this? Maybe you've been walking around it, avoiding the situation for years, and it's standing right in front of you. God does not want that obstacle, that barrier, that wall in front of you. If it's there, do something about it. Be obedient to God's word and believe in your miracle. So what's your step? Do you need to walk around something seven times in prayer, in petition? Do you need to truly worship God like we're going to have that ability to sing a song of promises that God comes through with his promises? Do you need to pray? Do you need to just pray more? Do you need to lay hands on that person? Do you need people to lay hands on you in a moment? We're going to have that opportunity. We're going to have a few people up here in just a moment that will be up here as we sing this last song. And if you need prayer, you come up here. They'll wear masks. We'll follow the social protocol. But we'll, we'll lay hands on you. We'll pray for that thing. Do you need to confess your struggle with someone else? Maybe it's that person right next to you. Maybe you don't want to come up here. Do you need consultation from one of your pastors? Do you need to go public with your faith and have a public baptism? Do you need to truly make God the Lord of your life? Do you need to just take your first step? My hope is that each one of us will begin living in the fullness of God and what he wants in our lives. Whatever the thing that is keeping you from getting there, know that God has plans for you plans to prosper you, not to harm you. He wants you to live a life of abundance. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a God of promises. That we need to be patient sometimes in the process, but you will come through just as you said you would. You made a public declaration to your servant Abraham that said, I will make your descendants as numerous as the sand in the sea, as numerous as the stars in the sky. And you fulfilled that. You said that eventually I will give your descendants their promised land. And you did that. And if you're the same then as you are today, then we know that our promises that you have given us can still be fulfilled. And I pray that today will be the day that we give that to you. That we ask for our Jericho moment. The Jericho moment for our family, for our own personal life, for our kingdom, for this nation, whatever it may be, that we will realize our Jericho moment. 
that we will see the power of God knock down the walls that are in front of us. Without us having to lift a stone, you will knock down the walls, and you have conquered our enemy. This is a battle that you have fought for us. We need to take a step. And I pray that if there's someone in this room, someone online that's never asked Jesus to be their Lord, that this will be the day that you would fully surrender your life in passion and full out pursuit of your son, Jesus Christ. For others, there may be some of us in the room that haven't done that. We're a believer. We follow you, but we haven't fully committed to you. Or maybe it's time to come back and right standing. So if that's you today, we're going to say a prayer together as a group. Whether you're at home, listening online, or listening in the future to this message, or sitting in this room, just know that when we say this prayer as a group, that if that's you, wanting to ask Jesus to be your Lord today, and if you believe it in your heart, then you will be saved. So please, as a congregation, please repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I messed up. And this morning, I ask for your forgiveness. Give me a fresh start. Be the king of my life. Help me from this day forward to live for you with everything I have, I will give to you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. And we're going to sing a song, a, a song of promises that God comes through. And we're going to have some staff members up here that are willing to pray for you. Whatever that thing is that's in front of you, if you want prayer, then come up here. We'll stay here as long as we need to. We want to see victory today. We want to see walls come crumbling down. So let's worship this song. If you're not comfortable coming up here, ask someone next to you to pray with you. Well, let's see victory today. It's time for each one of us to claim our victory. Thank you, Jesus. God of covenant, my faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to.
Though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Ooh, your history can prove there's nothing you can do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow out, they stay fast. And let my heart I just want to have a special time of prayer here as Weston is going to, he's going to close us out in prayer if you're okay with that. Let's give him a big round of applause and give him some encouragement here. Hold this close to your mouth, okay? Would you pray with us? Dear Father, I pray for my my um my miracle that if anybody else needs a miracle that you'll just ask God to help you have one too i pray that everyone in this room would choose to follow God and he will, and then they will praise him every day they don't even care if it's not church that they would just pray praise him amen amen thank you so much god is good he is so good there's living proof right here so this is the time where we will formally dismiss if you do need prayer please come up here and see the metcalfs
for the Patton Gills. They would gladly pray with you. But we do ask you to, if you want to have conversation, please do it outside the walls so we're following state code. Grab your kids, though, first. We're so blessed to see you, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Be blessed.